Hi again, Stuart here. Today we're going to talk about observability using .NET in Azure and some best practices. And while I wrote this with Azure specifically in mind, a lot of the guidance applies to observability in any cloud or enterprise system. So the first thing we need when we're going to talk about observability is what are we trying to achieve? What are our goals? So first and foremost, our system is now running over there. So what's happening? Secondly, we need to have sufficient detail. So when something does happen and it's not a good thing, that we have a way of troubleshooting. And lastly, we need the ability to predict the future. Is the rate of a particular problem increasing? Are we getting close to maxing out the CPU or the hard disk or whatever? And so observability is the ability to achieve the goals. And if you go and read a lot of the literature, there'll be a lot more goals in that. They'll be very erudite, very nuanced. But really, big picture, there's very little that doesn't fit into one of these goals. What's happening now, what happened in the past, and if it went wrong, what went wrong, and what is the future? The past, the present, the future gives you observability. So there's some basic tool, right? Azure has a very nice uh, mechanism called Application Insights. And as C-sharp developers, we can take more advantage of it by using the Microsoft Extensions logging package. There are lots of other packages that are available that will feed App Insights. But if we want to stay sort of pure to the core target of Azure, you really don't need much more than this and maybe some nice helper methods. And then lastly, through the Azure portal, we have the dynamic duo of the fact that every host, every backing service, every storage thing has the ability to enable App Insights and you can use the Azure portal and you can drill into that and you can use the Kusto query language, KQL, to make uh, queries about that. And we'll probably do some videos on, on handy queries in Kusto coming up, but just know that it's not very hard to learn, although there are some nuances. And there is an awful lot of things out on the interweb, including on YouTube, that show you how to use all of these tools. And of course, what's really great is that Microsoft has the Microsoft Log Analytics workspaces. And so they combine the ability to take that raw data that you can query using Kusto and fold, spindle, staple, mutilate it, transform it, and put it into dashboards and reports and all kinds of things that are useful. But there's a caveat, right? So the how to do it is pretty well documented. I'm going to focus in this video on why and what. Here's the thing. I've seen a ton of customers go into it and say, yes, observability is an architectural goal. It's one of the seven pillars of enterprise architecture. We're going to, to just do the daylights out of it. But then you go ask them, or you better yet, you go ask product support or QA, are the telemetry streams that you're getting, and for Azure, these are logs, audit items, and events, and the events, you know, have associated metrics, which can be very handy. You can get the count of how many fibbits you've put through this widget, and how many were successful, and how many weren't. But that pales in comparison with asking the question, is this doing us any good at all, right? We we can spend ballistic amounts of money, both in turning on App Insights or indeed any other logging telemetry tool. We can have all the most powerful tools in the world, but unless we're producing telemetry streams of good quality, and we're going to get to that, but we're also doing the really basic thing of, are people looking at the data, and then are they acting on the data? And that really only happens when the people with their shoulder to the wheel, the developers, the QA, the DevOps, the operations team, production support, find it valuable to look at 
what's in App Insights or to look at what's on a dashboard or when they do a Custo query in the tool that they actually get back something actionable. But also it comes down to teams making time to actually dive into logs and try to figure out what they're telling them. And more importantly, figure out what they're not telling them and say, you know what, we need to write a user story that says, we're not achieving this part of our goals because we cannot get blah, 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 blah. We need this team or that team or these teams to go and make this changes to the telemetry streams or we need this other team over here to write us a different dashboard and to do some data analytics and get us some actionable data. So if you're not looking at it and you're not acting on it and you don't have a management structure that is holding teams accountable to the goals that we just talked about, then you're not going to have a very effective observability platform and the bigger and more complicated your system gets the more moving parts it has the more instances it has if it's a tenanted system the more tenants it has the more important observability becomes otherwise what you have is a ginormous very expensive mojo box and you'll find that not only are you not allocating resources to address the right things but you may be spending ballistic amounts of money you don't have to. And the other thing is, is that goals, especially the sub goals, right? So underneath the past, present, and future ability of observability, there are specific things that the business or technology communities want to know. Are we using resources cost effectively? No business has an infinite amount of money to throw at a problem. Are we accomplishing our promises to whoever our downstream consumers are, our customers. Are we meeting the SLAs? Are we meeting the NFRs for the business? Are we providing an attractive and sticky experience that is reliable and accountable? And observability is the lens by which you look at those things. So it's not a one and done deal, right? You don't get to a place in your planning cycle and go, oh, observability is completely handled. This is a continuous improvement process in order to achieve sustained engineering. So we need some basic rules. And I like the RFC sort of style of, of rule articulation. I don't like always and never, although there are some exceptions. I haven't found a good use for dividing by zero, for example. But I find that if you go to other humans and you say, here's a set of rules and you couch them in, avoid doing this, prefer doing that, you'll probably have an easier time getting the humans to do that thing. So avoid collecting data that's not building out knowledge, that is, that's feeding the answer to the question of what happened in the past, what is happening in the present, and what will happen in the future. I see an awful lot of logging where people put in logging because there was a requirement that said you need to have logging. So developers just threw it in like candy. They had no goal in mind. They had no guidance. They had no, there was no accountability. They just checked the box that says we did the logging or we made this metric, irrespective of whether or not the metric is either accountably true or useful, or they recorded these events. Yippee, but if there are no consumers, why did you do it? Paired to that, right? If you just say this thing happened and there's no contact, what inferences can you draw from it? Not a lot. You need to make sure that as you're producing observability streams, telemetry streams, I use that interchangeably throughout the video, that there is enough metadata to give meaning to the thing that is flowing into the observability system so that when you look at an individual thing, and even better yet, when you look at a chain of things, they tell a story. So in other videos we've talked about, correlation and tracking IDs and the ability to follow a user journey. We talked about that in synthetic transactions. We've talked about it in other videos. And that is a sort of metadata that I'm talking of, but also contextual metadata. Having a log entry that says something bad happened is tremendously unhelpful. Whereas this bad thing happened, 
here was the data that contributed to that bad thing happening. It happened in this piece of code right here. And this was the generalized state of that thing. And it was trying to connect to that other thing over there. And this happened and I wasn't able to do this, right? That that's useful. Likewise, for other logging streams, a transaction happened. Well, yippee, what kind of transaction? Um, what was the context of the transaction? Is there data attached to the transaction that allow a business person to then assess the value of that transaction or the cost of that transaction? And more importantly, to compare one of those things to the other. Obviously, we want to avoid in our telemetry streams disclosing security sensitive information. There's a way to provide a surrogate for that and still have that metadata that gives context, then that's what you should do. Let me give you an example of a simply dreadful example from the real world I saw reasonably recently. There was a new authentication mechanism in a system and the developer wasn't quite sure whether or not the inputs to that authentication system resulted in the right output. So in desperation, they added logging of the raw inputs. In other words, they logged the username and the password in plain text into the observability stream. That's happened before out in the world. And when it's happened and hackers find it, then you end up on the front page of the Wall Street Journal or the San Jose Mercury News or the New York Times or worse, all of the above. And your name is and reputation as an organization is now mud. We need context, but you should work with your InfoSec partners to make sure that you're not disclosing things that would result in elevation of privilege or disclosure. Again, we want to prefer collecting data that addresses that temporal problem. What happened in the past? What's happening now? What will happen in the future? Context, but also you know, can we reasonably dice, slice, and julian this data along different axes or projections in order to make useful KPIs or understand system limits? Can we use as a predictive tool to say that our headroom of a particular piece of processing is coming towards the total ceiling of the system or that part of that subsystem, and at some point it's going to fall over. It's going to start failing because there's not enough capacity of whatever kind. And can we make that prediction temporarily into the future, not just in days or weeks or months? I always say that if, you know, one of the most unforgivable sins in enterprise systems is when you get alerts that are about items that are completely preventable. Let me give you an example. So an alert is what happens when your system is fallen over, either partially or completely. And the, my, my personal favorite one is disk out of space error. Because A, that's a metric that's easily obtainable in any cloud system, but particularly in Azure. B, it's 100% preventable because, first of all, we should have asked, why is this thing filling up? And is that a good thing? And three, we could have put in some reporting or some early warning, you know, logic very, very easily with very, very few clicks of the mouse or a quick piece of PowerShell that would have told us that that was going to happen. And we could have handled that during a preferred maintenance window. And instead of having an outage or an incident or reporters knocking on your door, you could have handled it before it became a problem when it was still something that could be predictively managed and proactively handled. We have to observe and then we have to act. If you have observability without action and action without accountability and accountability without relevancy to the goals you were trying to achieve, you haven't gotten anything out of your observability system. You've actually done harm. Be careful of retention period. Believe it or not, you can actually retain certain kinds of observability data for longer than your lawyers and or compliance organizations are comfortable with. But the other thing is, the more data you retain, the more it costs. Likewise, if you don't retain data for long enough, what happens is you find some long running problem. Let's just say there was a subtle processing error and the data 
on certain transactions were sort of funky, but you don't have enough history to go find out when that started happening. So you don't know what release or chunk of code uh, generation that was associated to. So you don't know when the problem started. And so you have to wash through all your data. And if you have petabytes and petabytes and petabytes of data, now you have something that could have been a trivial problem where you could have identified the targeted subset and operated on it. Uh, and now you have to go through a fishing expedition looking for a drop of salt water in the Pacific. And that's unpleasant. And of course, you want to make sure that as you collect telemetry, observability, logging, whatever you want to call it, streams, that you are providing as a second stage, you're providing different streams for the different technical consumers of the data, like operations or the developers or whomever, from the data that InfoSec might be interested in, or compliance, or indeed the business itself. Business KPIs are, the, are useful results of well-crafted telemetry systems and lead to observability of not just the system as a runtime entity, but also what is the observability on the underlying business process. Are we seeing more of this kind of transaction versus that kind of transaction? Is there seasonality or periodicity to the data? Do we need to do a better job of processing this sort of data? In other words, is the processing interval too long for a particular transaction type? And by transaction, I mean just any business process from end to end and not transaction is in the database sense, transaction in the business sense. And then you want to avoid misusing the provided logging category. Uh, Microsoft, Google, Amazon, pretty much everybody has settled on some flavor variation of the big six logging or telemetry categories. And it's built into uh, Microsoft.extensions.logging. It's built into operating systems like Windows and Linux. This notion that a particular telemetry item falls into one and only one of these categories. And we have a long diatribe about this in our 12 factor videos under logging, but it's worth repeating here. We want to make sure as part of the accountability that when we see telemetry items that are in a particular category, that they belong in that category. Particularly one of the things I see misused a lot is the semantic meanings of the top three get intermingled. They shouldn't be. There is absolutely a concrete, absolute right answer, an absolute wrong answer to whether or not something is critical, error, or warning. And the rules are blindingly clear. Again, watch the other video. Likewise, I see a commingling of information versus debug and trace. Debug and tracer for developers and QAs, etc., and information are typically telemetry streams that are relevant to the business or they're relevant to the technologists who then can relate useful information to the business about the business. So not commingling those things is a good thing and understanding them is a very good thing. And then you can go watch our 12 factor presentation on logging. Here is one of Stewart's famous virtuous cycles. This is fairly new. It's very Azure specific. But again, if you substituted different tools in here, you would have the same virtuous cycle with slightly different tools and flows. So it starts with project teams that are writing code. And by the way, they're not, you know, when I say code, I mean infrastructure, I mean configuration, I mean secrets, I mean business logic, I mean all of it. You started with a blank screen and you went into a tool and you started typing, creating intellectual property, you're creating a system and that system has lots of different pieces, but they're all just blobs of bytes. So we're gonna call that. And then the most important tool, again, from 12 Factor is the ability to then reliably and repeatedly build out that code, make sure that it's working as intended as much as possible, and then get that code off into hosts or backing services and data um, fed by configuration uh, with IO in between different things and 
the big bracket number three there is sicking or enabling Microsoft Application Insights to go through and grab all of those streams following whatever rules you've configured and then flowing those streams into Microsoft Log Analytics workspaces, which is one of the areas that um, you can use Cousteau. Of course, you can go to the Microsoft Application Insights dashboard for a particular resource, or in some cases, groups of resources, and do Cousteau queries, reusable Cousteau queries with the resulting analytics and, and dashboards and charts and tables and graphs and filters and things like are, are going to be in your log analytics workspaces, right? So you need something that is grabbing you know, raw telemetry and streaming it. You need somebody who's collecting it. And then you need the ability to do queries on it and build analytics on it and take those analytics and build visualizations for humans to look at, who, of course, then have to do analysis. Again, there's no point in collecting it if no one's going to look at it. And then they're going to act on that analysis and make changes to the code. And of course, at the same time, probably add new business value or change business process or whatever the whole point of the system is. And this is a virtuous cycle that is continuous, which gets us back to point number three. And that is, there's very little point in having an observability system if you don't look at it, act on it, be held accountable to it, and revise it as required and so you know those flows are nicely captured and you can freeze the presentation and go read the narrative but i basically gave it to you so the question is how do we give our telemetry streams more relevance so in azure there are three axes of relevance giving that are useful when in combined in the aggregate, you can get more than the individual parts worth of analytics out, which means you can understand your system more thoroughly, more deeply, more in a more nuanced way. And so they are, for the love of Pete, put decent metadata on your provisioned Azure infrastructure not just the owning team, but also task and purpose and environment, right? Anything that you'd want to be able to ask a question about. For example, if you have infrastructure out in the universe, you should be able to ask questions like, give me a list of all of the SQL servers in the QA environment that are dedicated to the reporting projects team. If you can't do that, you haven't put the right metadata on your infrastructure. It's very easy to query and combined with these other things is very useful. Configuration. And by that, I mean configuration, secrets management, anything that varies by environment or by deployable unit is in my mind configuration. Again, you can go watch the many, many videos we've done on 12 factor. Um, you know, configuration goes with the environment. Configuration is more than just name value pairs go watch those videos but if you can ask the question at this moment in time what was the configuration of this thing then hooray you've succeeded there are other similar relevant questions of course and then the part where the developers come in right is the dotnet runtime will emit a fair number of useful telemetry streams all on its own especially if you just enable them as part of the base configuration of your system. But the real value is using the library and emitting your own logging streams, your own auditing streams, your own metrics, your own events, using the provided Microsoft library or things built on top of it. Um, parenthetically, you can use other things, but they probably won't play well with App Insights, so why bother? And the person who told you you'd be running your system on multiple different clouds unless you're a maker of software you sell to other people probably was deeply, deeply wrong and confused because it's rare. Ride the horse that brought you, write the thing that's closest to the native provided things. And, and for telemetry particularly, that's particularly relevant. 
if you're going to write something in Kubernetes, make sure that you, and you're using, say, Azure Kubernetes service, you want to make sure that you enable certain things on the infrastructure, you emit certain tags for your, not just your, your container images, but also the running instances. And you want to make sure that the configuration has history and all that sort of stuff. And then you want to make sure that you use the variations on the provided libraries from Microsoft that will emit Kubernetes compatible telemetry that with the other telemetry provided by Kubernetes will give you a holistic picture of what happened in the past, what is happening now, and what is likely to happen in the future. So this is the accountability part. If you just go to your developers and say, dude, add some logging. The worst thing I ever saw was a requirement that said they wanted three log messages per hundred lines of code. And the developers maliciously complied to meet the requirement. And QA tested it and said, yay, verily, we did a count of the number of lines of code. And we did a, a count of the lines being in logs being emitted by each module. But nobody bothered to ask, is it useful or relevant or predictive or diagnostic, right? They just maliciously complied. Don't go to tell your developers to do all this telemetry in their code. Work with them to say, you know, for this business use case, we want to cover, we want to emit this event and we want to attach this metric to it so that we can aggregate those. For your exceptions, this is kind of the metadata we want them to accomplish that. And if you want to write a little helper class that helps enrich the logging stream produced by the Microsoft library, that's great. Uh, many projects that I've been on do, and they do, they, it is useful. Developers have to write fewer things to get context added to their exception or their logging message. And of course, we want QA to do more than just say, yeah, something came out. We want them to be judges of, is that a useful something? Is it properly categorized? Does it have metadata that would assist in any of our big three goals? Again, past, present, and future. It's not pixie dust. You can't just go say, I'm going to add telemetry to my systems and I'll have observability and it'll be great because it won't. So here are the two basic questions. And you want to enable your project teams to self-validate by asking questions. Like, if I add this telemetry item, does it contribute to meeting the goal? But also, you got to ask the negative question. If in this module or this chunk of business functionality, if I don't emit a telemetry item, what am I missing? How... Or is my march to my goal a diminishment? And here's where the Pareto rule kicks in, right? 80% of emitted telemetry, right, covers the vast majority of what you need. And adding the next 20% is not only significantly more expensive, but is probably not going to be useful in proportion to its cost. It's all about balance, but that's why it's important to revisit the telemetry stream outputs and go, you know, we decided we'd emit uh, an event with a coupled metric to this, or we decided that we would log in this particular use case. Uh, are we getting anything out of it? Maybe we shouldn't do that. Maybe we should be doing something else. Maybe we are doing that, but there's not enough metadata attached to that enough context for it to be really useful instead of just sort of checking the box that says observability. This is where accountability comes in. We have to have responsibilities by role. Who, what organizational units are responsible for what? So setting the business goals, past, present, and future, and then creating, you know, sub goals under those that align with cost service levels and NFRs, right, is the business of the project leadership, which should be a hybrid of the business and technical communities. The technical project leadership should understand the output of the project leadership and guide the whole system, right, the whole, all of the project teams 
to achieving those goals. Developers should, in the cases where they are required to add logging or auditing or metrics or events to the code that they're doing it, QA should make sure that it's being done according to the specification. Information security should be there to make sure that we're not logging things that are or emitting telemetry that is unfortunate, like usernames and passwords. And DevOps engineers should make sure that the infrastructure and the network and all of the other pieces upon which our code as developers runs, not only is emitting telemetry, but emitting useful telemetry, and then it has metadata. And then lastly, our compliance organizations are in the business of certifying that as a whole system, we are obeying the rules set by not just the project leadership, but the enterprise leadership, and that we're not doing the things we're not supposed to do, and we are doing the things we are supposed to do, and we're doing them in a way that is cost effective, where the value is greater than the cost that was added to the program. There's lots of detailed guides, including some of mine with source code in GitHub, that show you how to do the nuts and bolts of, oh, I want to do this and how to emit this thing. But this video was about what is the strategy? What are the goals? What are the definitions? And I hope it was helpful. My name is Stuart. Thank you for your kind attention.